the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the sweet communion of God's Holy Spirit be with you one and all. Welcome to the second Sunday after Pentecost, this Father's Day 2022 worship service for Church of the Master Presbyterian Church USA located in Atlanta, Georgia. We are delighted that you've chosen to worship with us. So come with us now as we go forth in intentional worship of our triumph God. Greetings. Please join me for our call to worship. When forces in the world threatens us, when our bodies and spirits turn against us, there is one who seeks us, one who meets us, one who heals us, whose love washes over us and sets us free for joy. This one is the Lord. Come, let us worship God. Pray with me, church family. God, we ask that you grant us an eternal spirit of gratitude, of gratefulness. We ask that you forgive us of all of our sins, those we commit knowingly, those we commit unknowingly. <laughs> More than any of that, we just stand before you in awe. We just, we just want to be one with you. We ask during these times of peril, uncertainty, trials, and tribulation, that you continue to give us levity, give us hope, buoyancy, as we march through these earth plains to fulfill your purpose. With boldness and courage, we seek to fulfill all that is good within us and to destroy all that is wicked within and around us. And we ask all of this, we exude all of this in a mighty, powerful, essential name of Jesus, the Christ. Amen.
call to confession. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin to God and to one another. Prayer of confession. Together, please. Infinite word of truth, breathe upon us the refreshing breath of your Holy Spirit and forgive our transgressions. Cleanse our hearts of false doctrine by the winds of righteousness and truth. Purge us by the fires of your eternal judgment, and we shall be pure. Shake the foundations of our jealousy and selfishness and cast us anew in the image of Christ Jesus. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Beloved, here's the good news, and it is good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins and his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and be alive to all that is good. So I declare to you in the name of the risen one that you are, I am, we are forgiven. Now go and do likewise and be at peace. We turn now to the proclamation of the word portion of our worship service for this Lord's Day. After our prayer of illumination, our scripture readings for today will be as follows. The Old Testament text comes from the first book of Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 through 15. And the New Testament lesson comes from Paul's letter to the church at Galatia. Galatians 3, verses 23 through 29. Pray with me. Holy, holy, holy one, your words feed us, the word frees us, and the spirit gives us life. Grant our ears an appetite for hearing our spirit's strength for loving you. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament reading will come from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 15. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in, Ju in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom, brush, broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb. The mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. 
the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our New Testament scripture comes from Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now this faith has come. We are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. For you are all, are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Beloved, this morning the sermon reminds us that God provides. God provides. Pray with me, please. O oh God of light and truth, you have led us by your word to this preaching moment. We have come with open hearts, open minds, and open spirits, anxious to hear but a word from you. We ask now that you suspend our thoughts, our cares, and our concerns, still all the noise, the chaos, and confusion that surrounds us, then quiet our hearts so that we might hear the word that you have for each of us in the sheer silence of your still, small voice. Now, God, for as much as without thee we're not able to please thee, mercifully grant that thy Holy Spirit may in all things that follow direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray, come now, Holy Spirit. Come now, Holy Spirit. Take this time and make it your own. Amen. Amen. Beloved. Our lections cause us to take a look, a strong look at what nourishes us, what fills us up, what sustains us. And as we embrace these texts, if we are truly reflective, we might find ourselves pondering these questions. What do you hunger for in life? Do you hunger for things you truly need, or do you hunger for things you want, but which may not be good for you or for those around you? What do you hunger for in life? Do you hunger only for things you truly need, or do you hunger for things you want, 
but which may not be good for you or for those around you. Hmm. Now, our Psalter lesson reminds us to rejoice in the goodness of the Lord, for God provides all that we need, all that it takes to sustain us physically, emotionally, and spiritually. All we have to do is taste and see that the Lord is good. And that is a good starting point. Still, I believe we can find our answers to our questions this morning in the story of Elijah. Now, when we find the prophet Elijah in this 19th chapter of 1 Kings, he is not at his best. He is alone, defeated, fearful, and faithless. The Elijah we see seated under the broom tree is a far cry. Yes, a far cry from the prophet who had achieved success beyond measure in the previous chapters. Yes, that Elijah had done what every prophet would like to do. He predicted a drought and it was painfully dry for three years. He challenged the priest at Baal to a battle on Mount Carmel and brought down fire from heaven as he decisively won that battle. He prayed for rain to do away with the drought and the rain came in torrents. But church, beloved, the Elijah we see seated under that broom tree is not that same guy. Yes, this Elijah is consumed by fear, self-pity, and self-doubt. This Elijah who has run from Ahab and Jezebel, this Elijah, this guy, is in a state of deep depression. He is in the midst of a full-blown pity party, and he is feeling sorry for himself. But now, beloved, it's not without cause, for you see, in his way of thinking, in his way of thinking, life had thrown him an unexpected curveball. His perfectly stacked apple cart has been upset. His disciplined and well-schooled ducks are no longer in a row. He was now in exile, fleeing for his life. He is now in hiding, preferring death to living, and he could not understand why, why it had come to that. Have you ever been like that? <laughs> yes, when we see Elijah in our text for this morning, he has taken Jezebel at her word, and based on his knowledge of her power, her prestige, her privilege, and most importantly, her persistence, he did what he thought was wise and he decided to flee. Now, at first glance, it appeared that he was running to save his life. In fact, that is what it says in verse 3. It says, then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life. For his life. But beloved, as we read on, we see that Elijah was so despondent, so depressed, so downtrodden by the thought of possibly dying at Jezebel's hands that he goes deep into the wilderness, seeks out a solitary place, and asks the Lord, ask our God to just let him die. See that in verse 4? It says, he came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. Now, most of us, most of us who have done a good amount of living, we know something about this desperate state of depression Elijah found himself in. We may not have hit rock bottom as did Elijah, but some of us have been pretty doggone close. 
truth of the matter is that as you go through life, life will have its ups and its downs, its highs and its lows. Beloved, it is almost a certain fact that as you live this life, as high as you soar is as low as you will go. No matter how steady you set your course, how righteous and steady your steps are in the Lord, you will have your mountaintop experiences and you will have your time, yes, your time in the low, lonesome valley. You're going to make some good friends and you're going to get closely acquainted with some more than capable enemies. As many of us, like Elijah, know something about the bad times. We know something about the fear and the faltering faith that sent Elijah fleeing into the wilderness. For we have had the Jezebels of life hot on our trails, hounding us at every turn, hunting us down by every means possible seeking to destroy our very lives. I know you know what I'm talking about. The Jezebel that is a bad relationship. The Jezebel that is a bad habit, a lifelong addiction. The Jezebel that is low self-esteem, poor self-worth. The Jezebel that tells you that vengeance is what is right, that Forgiveness is passe, something that only weak folks do. The Jezebel that whispers in your ear, get all you can while you can and forget about the rest. The Jezebel that tells you that you are a fool. Yes, a fool if you love your enemies and you are an idiot if you seek to care for the least of these and if you work for justice. Yes, if we speak our truth here, we must admit that we know something about the fear that drove Elijah into the wilderness. We know something about the state of depression that had him seated under that broom tree, praying to God to just let him die. Elijah, this man of God, no, 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 check this. Elijah, this powerful man of God, is depressed. He's tired. He's ready to give it all up. His angst has given way to anxiety. His anxiety has yielded to apathy. He is done. He wants no more. He said, I did all the things God asked me to do. Not only did I do them, but I succeeded at them. It's not like I tried and failed or did not know what to do or did not try at all. No, I did what I was supposed to do and I succeeded. But look at me now. I am depressed, destitute. I'm an object failure. It seems that failure is the price of my success. Beloved, I believe that it is here that Elijah's reasoning fails him, much the same as it does for most of us. You see, beloved, failure does not consist in stumbling and falling. <laughs> We're going to fall down. The failure, beloved, is always in staying there in being stuck, in being stagnant, in staying down. In Elijah's case, he has become so caught up in his victories that he labeled them successes. He made them the means to an end, the end all to his journey. Yes, Elijah, like many of us, was short-sighted. He did what he was supposed to do, what he was told to do, what he was gifted to do, never thinking that what he thought of as a victory was but a stepping stone to the next thing. 
Elijah, like most of us, had not learned what most creative folks know. And that is an essential part of creativity is not being afraid to fail. Not being afraid to fail. You see, creative folks call their activities their work. They call them hypotheses and experiments. And this all by itself gives them permission to, and I want you to hear this now, it gives them permission to fail repeatedly until in the end they get the results they want. Then they move on to their next thing. <laughs> They're smart folks. But not our Elijah. When the tide did not turn with his victory, when the remnant did not return to right relationship with God, when his enemy regrouped and doubled down, he wanted to pack it in. He declared he was done. He wants to go on to glory. But look here in verse 5. It says, suddenly an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. See that, beloved? When Elijah had given up on himself, God had not. And isn't that the way it is? When we make an attempt to live our lives in concert with God, when we align our will with God's will, no matter how bad things get, no matter how defeated we think we are, our God does not give up on us. Not only does God not give up on us, but God can and God will send somebody or something to us to turn us around, to bring us back, to make us get up and eat. Make no mistake about it, beloved. When bad things happen to good people, God will compel, God will take care. But hear this now, God will not participate in your pity party. You see, God is a God of action. God is a God of purpose. And when you are down, God is the one that compels you to get up. God is about turning you and converting you and moving you forward. And God will use any means possible to get you moving, be it an angel of, of mercy or the fear of a Jezebel being hot on your track. My brothers and my sisters in Christ, this lesson about living that Elijah learned under that broom tree applies to each and every one of us. When life gives us cause to pause, when life circumstances disappoint us to the point that we are destitute, despondent, and depressed, when we are consumed by our own hungers, overwhelmed by our own need for nourishment, sustenance to sustain us physically, emotionally, and spiritually, that's when we need to still ourselves and seek out that still, small voice that reassures us and tells us to get up, go on, and eat. Then get on with it. Go on, and my grace will be with you, for my grace is sufficient for your needs. When we reach that crossroad in our living, when we don't know if we're coming or going, and life with all of its challenges has slowed our pace to a crawl. We need to still ourselves and seek out that still small voice that reminds us that we can do all things. Yes, all things through Christ who strengthens us. When life loses its luster and loneliness and sadness are the order of the day. That is when we need to still ourselves and seek out that still small voice that reminds us that, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. What 
do you hunger for? What do you need to sustain you? What do you need to nourish you? Beloved, as you look for your answers, I challenge you to heed the words of the psalmist. Just taste and see that the Lord is good. If you can do that, I can guarantee you that God will provide. And on this Lord's day and all the days to come, that is the good news. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen, amen. turn now to the service of giving for this Lord's Day. Beloved, thank you for your generosity that you've shown Church of the Master. God gives us more than enough for our journey of faith. Let us now present our gifts of time, talent, and treasure so that others may know their blessings and that we may give thanks to our triumph God. Please give. Prayer of Thanksgiving. Pray with me, please. 
With these gifts, O oh God, we remember with thanksgiving the life we have because of you. Make us grateful every day for the privilege of offering ourselves for the well-being of all your world. Amen. A parting word. We'd like to thank our worship leaders for this Lord's Day. Elders Zettler Clay IV and Kendra Matthews serving as our liturgists. Brendan Michael for scripture. Our virtual musicians, Mrs. Sheila Wheat Harris, Miss S. Renee Clark, and Deacon Leela Bolden. And our video producer, Elder Anthony Meadows. Beloved, take this charge. Worship God alone. Do not be overcome by evil powers. Trust God. Rejoice in your salvation by loving others to the glory of God. Now may God feed you, Christ protect you. May God's Holy Spirit live in you and wash over you with the love of God. Now, henceforth and forevermore, Amen, amen. Until we gather again in this virtual space, I am the Reverend Dr. Cecilia A. Taylor, pastor of Church of the Master Presbyterian Church, USA, located in Atlanta, Georgia. We do hope to see you soon.